Welcome everyone to part three in our series on analysis methods in NLP. We're going to be talking about adversarial training as well as testing of systems. This is the second of the behavioral evaluation methods that we're considering. We previously talked about adversarial testing. Adversarial training and testing, of course, implies that we have a much larger data set, so this is more difficult to do. Um, but for selected tasks where we have such data sets, this can be very exciting and push you to address all sorts of interesting cutting edge questions. I'll start with SWAG. This is an early entry into the space of adversarial train sets. SWAG stands for Situations with Adversarial Generations. Um, it, there's actually two data sets, SWAG and the colorfully named Hella SWAG. And you'll see why there are two in a second. This is fundamentally, again, another interesting story of very rapid progress in our field. Here's how SWAG examples work. We're given as a system input uh, a context, like he is throwing darts at a target. And another system input, which is the start of a sentence. Here it's another man. And the task of the system is to figure out what the continuation should be. So the actual continuation that we predict might be throws a dart at the target board. Uh, this is fundamentally a classification task. The system is given some distractors, like comes running in and shoots an arrow at a target or is shown on the side of men or throws darts at a disc. And the system is tasked with figuring out which of the options is the actual continuation for the sentence given the context. The data sources for this are ActivityNet and the large scale movie description challenge. I think the idea here is that we're gonna key into all sorts of interesting notions of common sense reasoning. Now here's where the adversarial part of this comes in. We're gonna do adversarial filtering for SWAG. For each of the examples in our corpus, and there are over 100,000 examples in SWAG, we're gonna be given the system input like the mixture creams, the butter, sugar. And then we'll have a generator model. In the case of SWAG, this was an LSTM, produce some distractors for the target. So let's suppose that the actual target continuation is, is added. We'd have a model produce is sweet and is in many foods. And then we have the filtering model. If it guesses correctly if for is added, then we're gonna drop out this entire example and we'll create some new distractors like is sprinkled on top or is in many foods. And in this case, if the model guesses incorrectly, like suppose it, it chooses B in this case, then we'll keep this example because relative to the current models for the, language, the thing we're using to generate these distractors and the thing that we're used to using to filter, this is a challenging example. And the idea is that we can repeat this for a bunch of iterations, continually retraining the filtering model so that it gets better and better, and therefore ending up with a data set that is really, really difficult in terms of the current models that we had available to us. Here's a picture of test accuracy. This is kind of interesting here. They actually did an ensemble of filtering models to try and to key into different notions that might be indicating which is the correct continuation. So they start by using just a multi-layer perceptron for efficiency, and then they bring in all of these ensembles. And you can see that test accuracy as we do this iterative filtering very quickly goes down so that by iteration 140, we're at 10% accuracy. So that's the sense in which this is a very difficult data set because given the generator model and the filtering model that we have available to us, we have a data set that is very difficult in terms of a classification task. So that looks really exciting and challenging. And I think the authors expected this data set to last for a very long time. However, the BERT paper, the original BERT paper did evaluations on SWAG and essentially solved the problems. BERT large got 86.6 and 86.3 on the Devon test sets for SWAG respectively. A very unexpected result given that I just showed you that the SWAG authors got about 10% with their current models and even closely related models to BERT, like this eSIM model here, were really pretty low in their performance. So BERT looked like a real breakthrough, and you can see that it's in some sense kind of superhuman relative to the SWAG estimates. So wow. So of course, we know what the response should be, given that we're talking essentially about model in the loop adversarial data set creation. That leads us to Hella SWAG. They made some changes to the data sets that they used for Hella SWAG, but I would say the fundamental thing is that we do the same kind of adversarial filtering with a generator, except now we have much more powerful filtering and generator models thanks to developments related to transformers. So for Helleswag, we again have human performance that's really good. This is very reassuring because we are using much more powerful models at step four. As you can expect, BERT is no longer easily able to solve this problem 
Here's a further summary of the results with Bert Large before, remember that had essentially solved swag. Now it's down around 50%, which um, shows that it still gets traction, but is nothing like the human perform superhuman performance that we saw for swag. Okay, now let's move into a slightly different mode. And this is gonna be a kind of human in the loop adversarial data set creation method. The first entry in this space was the adversarial NLI data set. I think this is a really visionary and exciting paper. Um, adversarial NLI is a direct response to the previous things that we've seen with the SNLI and multi-NLI data sets where models seem to do well on those benchmarks but are easily susceptible to simple adversaries. With adversarial NLI, we're gonna hopefully push systems to be much more robust to those adversaries and explore a much wider range of the space of things you might see under the heading of natural language inference. So here's how it worked. There's a human in the loop, an annotator, and the annotator is presented with a premise sentence and a condition that they need to be in, which is just an NLI label, entailment, contradiction, or neutral. The annotator writes a hypothesis to go along with the premise and the condition. And then a state-of-the-art model comes in and makes a prediction about the premise hypothesis pair. If the model's prediction matches the condition, that is, if the model was correct, then the annotator needs to return to step two and try again with a new hypothesis. And we could continue in that loop. If the model was fooled, the premise hypothesis pair is independently validated by other annotators, of course. So what we get out of this is, we hope, a data set that is intuitive for humans because of the check at step five. But assuming we continue to loop around through two, three, and four, an example that is really difficult for whatever model is in the loop. And the expectation is that as we put better and better models in the loop here, we're going to get even more challenging data sets as an outcome. NLI examples tend to be impressively complex. You can see that this example has a very long premise. The hypothesis is relatively shorter. And an intriguing aspect of adversarial NLI is that annotators also constructed a reason or a rationale for their label holding between the premise hypothesis pair. To date, as far as I know, relatively little use has been made of these texts, but I think they could bring in other aspects of natural language inference reasoning, and that could be an exciting new direction. Adversarial NLI is a difficult data set indeed. We have a similar sort of leaderboard that we've seen throughout this adversarial regime where uh, across different rounds of ANLI, there are three, or cumulatively for the data set, even really excellent models that do really well on SNLI and multi-NLI are posting really low numbers for all of these variants of the data set. And that shows you that this is truly a difficult problem. And as far as I know, not much progress has been made uh, since this data set was released on boosting these numbers. So it stands as an interesting challenge. Stepping back here, I'd just like to say that I think we find in this paper a real vision for future development. And that you see this also in the SWAG and Hella SWAG papers, as they, those authors say, this adversarial data set creation is a path for NLP progress going forward toward benchmarks that adversarially co-evolve with evolving state-of-the-art models, right? With SWAG and Hella SWAG, we saw this. SWAG got solved, but the response was clear. Bring the best model in and use it to create the successor data set that stands as a real challenge. We have a similar picture from the adversarial NLI paper. This process of having iterative rounds with humans in the loop yields a moving post dynamic target for natural language understanding systems rather than the static benchmarks that eventually saturate. And we've seen repeatedly that our benchmarks saturate very quickly these days. So we need this kind of moving post to make sure we continue to make meaningful progress. The Neodal project gave rise, I believe, to this Dynabench platform, an open source platform for model and human in the loop data set creation. There, as of, as of this writing, there are four data sets available that have been created on Dynabench, an NLI data set, which is a kind of successor to ANLI, a question answering data set, a sentiment data set, data set and a hate speech data set. So if you're working on problems of this form or you have a model that would fit into this mold for one of these tasks, I would encourage you to explore some training of the systems on these data sets to see whether you're making progress uh, or whether they stand as true adversaries for whatever innovative thing you're doing. Finally, I wanna close with a really important question for this area that kind of remains open. Can adversarial training improve systems? There is a course of concern that as we construct ever harder data sets, we're pushing systems into stranger parts of the linguistic and conceptual space 
which could actually degrade their real world, world performance. We have to keep an eye on that. And the evidence so far, I think is pointing to yes as an answer to this question, but the evidence is a bit mixed. So I've mentioned that in the squad adversarial paper from Jia and Liang, training on adversarial examples makes them more robust to those examples, but not to simple variants. So it's hardly very much progress. In this paper, they found that adversarial training provided no additional robustness benefit in, our, in the experiments using the test set, despite the fact that the model achieved near 100% accuracy classifying adversarial examples included in the train set. So that's a more worrisome picture. Um, but this is more hopeful. Fine tuning with a few adversarial examples improves systems in some cases, especially where you, where you bring in inoculation. And this is hopeful yet again. Adversarially generated paraphrases improve model robustness to syntactic variation. That's really the dream there, that as a result of doing this new kind of training, we get systems that are truly more robust. But I think we need more evidence on this picture, which means more data sets of this form and more an interesting use of the available resources. And I would just love to see what the emerging picture is over the next year or two.